Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! For many of you, what you're looking for from the deal Mr Cameron is trying to hammer out before the in-out referendum on Europe expected in the summer is a way to bring down the number of Europeans moving to Britain, to bring down immigration. Which is why our political guru, Norman Smith, on your behalf, has been sorting out what is fact and what is fiction when it comes to immigration and the EU. For many, immigration is the key issue in this referendum. Put simply, many fear there are too many EU migrants coming here. So is the European Union part of the problem or part of the solution? Well, here's my take on the Euro facts and Euro fiction. Let's start with the EU rulebook. Freedom of movement. It's one of the basic rules of the EU. What does it mean? Well, it means if you're an EU citizen, you can live and work anywhere you like in the EU. It means there's nothing, zilch, rien, the government can do to bar EU citizens from coming here. And that's a Euro fact. Which brings us to the numbers. Well, here's my Euro calculator, so let's do the figures. Last year, Net immigration reached a record high of 336,000. Now, of these, more than half came from the EU. That's 180,000. And that number is rising quickly. Last year, it shot up by 42,000. So, immigration from the rest of the EU is significant and is rising fast. And that's another Euro fact. But should we be concerned that they're coming here because of our benefit system? Well, the government paid £30 million in child benefit in 2014 to families with children living abroad. And of these, two-thirds of the claimants were Polish. That's a Euro fact. But more than 90% say they come to Britain to find work or study, and only around 2%, just 2%, end up unemployed. That would suggest it's a Euro fiction to say most come to live on benefits, even though tax credits may boost their wages in Britain. Are EU migrants putting too great a strain on our public services? Well, let's take two for an example, schools and hospitals. There are over a million children at schools in England who have English as a second language. Now, this has more than doubled since 1997. But these figures are for all pupils, not just EU migrants. And let's look at hospitals. Well, here, the government estimate, the total cost of the use of the NHS by migrants is almost £2 billion. But these figures include anyone who isn't British. So, students, workers on visas, tourists, immigrants, expats popping back to see their old GP. So, the bill for EU migrants, who tend to be younger and healthier, is likely to be a fraction of that. It may not be a Euro fiction, but there aren't many Euro facts to prove EU migrants are a costly burden on public services. The European Union. Confused? Here's how it works. We'll start with the European Commission. It's the powerful civil service of the EU. The engine room, if you like. It's run by 28 commissioners, one from each member country. It administers much of the money that the EU spends. But this is also where new laws are born. It's political. The Commission is based in Brussels, in this glass and steel building with lots of flags in front of it. Next, the European Parliament. It's based in Brussels, in this glass and steel building, but sometimes everyone goes to this glass and steel building in Strasbourg instead.
Members, or MEPs, sit here. There are 751 from all over Europe. Parliament started as an underpowered talking shop, but has become a serious player, voting on nearly all the laws proposed by the European Commission. There's more. The Council of the European Union. It's where the governments of the 28 member countries have their say. Representatives of said governments meet in this building in Brussels. Sometimes all the leaders meet here to give political direction to the EU. Generally, there's a deal at the end. It's usually a compromise. One more thing. There's the European Court of Justice. It's there to make sure everyone sticks to the rules and follows the laws. It also sorts out squabbles between the Commission, the Council and the Parliament. It's in Luxembourg and it looks like this. And in a nutshell, that's how the EU works. Norman is here. Hello. Hi. Right, what's going on in Brussels today? Well, we're getting to the poker player moment when the politicians have to eyeball each other and they have to play their hands. And what we seem to be seeing is that Mr Cameron may have to fold on a key issue, namely child benefit, because you remember at the start of this whole process, he told us that the idea that EU migrants in the Britain could claim child benefit for children living back in Poland or, I don't know, the Czech Republic, that was nonsense. It had to stop. However, as the negotiations went on, he couldn't secure that concession. Instead, what he got was an agreement that in future they'd still get the child benefit, but it would be indexed linked to the cost of living in those countries. So in Poland or whatever, they'd get whatever the proportion was in terms of the cost of living. Mm -hmm. However, it now seems he may not even get that in full because the signs are that will only apply to newcomers to the UK, so new Eastern European migrants arriving, which means all 34,000 who currently claim child benefit will still get it. It's only the newcomers who will have it index linked. And why this matters is because his critics are just waiting to pounce on this deal and say, it's feeble, it's a washout, you haven't got anything. OK, so if that does happen and he doesn't get what he wants there, how will he sell that to the British electorate ahead of this referendum? Well, there is an upside of sorts to this, mm. of sorts, in that Mr Cameron wants to have a fight. He wants to emerge on Friday morning all bleary-eyed, unshaven, as if he's just done five rounds with a gorilla. He does not want to look all prim and pristine, as if he's had a sort of creme brulee with the European leaders and it's all been, there you go, Dave, you can have what you want. He wants a real tussle. So if he has a bust-up ahead of the summit... That's not a problem for David Cameron, provided, provided he gets some sort of result. The real danger is he has a bust up and doesn't win. And he loses, yeah. then he's in trouble. OK, let me just read you this, Norman. It's just coming in. It's from Nigel Farage. Um, David Cameron was supposed to meet certain group leaders yeah. from the European... Do you know this already? Well, I kind of go on and you go. You're guessing. Yeah. You know what's happening. You're coming, don't you? Uh, so he's uh, supposed to meet various um, party group leaders from the European Parliament, was supposed to meet UKIP leader and MEP Nigel Farage. Mm. He's now saying, today's visit was a total insult to four and a half million voters who voted for UKIP in the European elections. Mr Cameron changed his entire schedule just to avoid <laughs> seeing me. Several of the group leaders in Parliament have problems with his proposed deal and he continues to run scared of the news getting out that the Parliament will vote this deal down if it comes here after the referendum. OK, so what happened, and Nigel Farage has a point in this sense, was originally Mr Cameron said, look, a lot of what I'm proposing is going to have to get the OK from the European Parliament, so I'm going to see all the leaders of all the different main groupings in the European Parliament. The leader of one of those groupings is, yes, the UKIP leader, Nigel Farage. Mm -hmm. However, Downing Street is saying, hang on a sec, he's got to be here, there and everywhere. He's got to see Martin Schulz. He's got to see uh, Mr Juncker. He saw President Hollande last night. He really doesn't have time to see Mr Farage. Mm -hmm. But you can quite imagine Downing Street do not want the choreography of David Cameron, you know, getting a hard time from Nigel Farage. So I imagine they rather conveniently thought, oh dear, oh dear, terribly sorry, Nigel, we can't make it. Sorry about that. Fair enough. Thursday, Friday, this European summit. By Friday night, mm -hmm. what, what, where, where will we be? We Look at your crystal ball. We will be in go mode, I think. OK. So what will happen is on Thursday, maybe very, very late after the dinner, a deal will pretty much be done. 
Then I expect Mr Cameron will come out round about one o'clock Friday lunchtime. Big press moment. Mm -hmm. Victory in our time. I've got the deal. Mm -hmm. Then he rushes back to London where he has to hold this cabinet meeting because his cabinet critics are saying, hang on a sec, we want a cabinet meeting as soon as you've done the deal so we are allowed off the leash so we can criticise what you've done. Cabinet meeting, guesswork here, about five o'clock. Six o'clock, I would expect Mr Cameron to emerge from number 10 and there'll be a podium moment where he says, here is the historic referendum I have promised you and then we are off. So my expectation, and it is an expectation because, you know, all sorts of yeah, things yeah, yeah. can go wrong, but my expectation is cometh Friday night, we will be in go mode for the referendum. There's a big, big rally being planned by those who want to leave the union on Friday evening and it will be all systems go. Okay. <laughs> we will look forward to it. Well, you will anyway. Thank you very much. Cheers, Norman. Thank you.